You know, it seems that uh, since uh, September 11th, you know, the attack in New York City, it seems that we live in a more worrisome world. It's always been worrisome, but somehow we're reminded of it a whole lot these days. There's a war in Iraq that has cost the United States many lives, an enormous amount of money, and seems not even resolved to this day. There are ongoing terrorist strikes against various nations each day. Who knows? Could be here as well. There's an economic instability that affects each of us in some way as the unemployment rate goes up and down and our paychecks seem, seem to shrink. Of course, all of this plus the normal challenges of everyday life, like if that wasn't enough, <laughs> you know, if that wasn't enough, somebody's thinking of trying to blow us up, then there's the everyday stuff. Raising children in an increasingly dangerous and complex world. Keeping up with the pressures of school or work or caring for a family. Some people having to do all three of those. And then there are health and emotional issues that demand attention. We've just had a, just a few prayer requests. I think if we had the time, we could go through the entire audience here and, and everybody could fill out a blue card because I'm, I'm convinced that everybody's got someone in their family or their close you know, acquaintances that is struggling with some kind of illness or family difficulty. And then in addition to all of these things that people must deal with, for those who are Christians, there's the question of service and support of our church life, and sometimes the very painful experience of working through disagreements or offenses that may occur in every congregation from time to time. Some are going through that. You know, some people may look at all of this and say that all they want to do is find a warm blanket and take a long nap in a safe and cozy place. You know, you know what I'm saying? Take the blanket, put it up like this, and of course, this is what children need to do to calm their fears and their anxieties. But you see, children are not responsible for the world. And children are not responsible for the church. We are. We're responsible. So what we need at a time such as this is a strong dose of courage. It'd be nice if we could just order it up, take a drink of this courage when needed, but we all know it doesn't work like that. You know, courage is composed of many elements that come together to fill a person's heart with strength and power to overcome fear and great obstacles. Courage as a human quality is timeless. You ever notice that? Courage is the same today as it was 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. Courage is courage. It's always the same, the same thing. It has no language, it has no culture, and it resides in no special country or no special heart. In a recent survey in the military, soldiers in every branch of the military were asked what one thing frightened them the most about going into battle. Now you'd think that perhaps getting wounded or being killed or being captured by the enemy and tortured by the enemy, that would be the number one thing they were afraid of. Number one thing on their list. You'd think that would be it. But when the results were tallied, the number one thing that military personnel feared the most was the situation where they would lack courage under fire. That's what they were most afraid of, psychologically. They would rather be wounded or captured, even tortured, than be seen as weak or cowardly in the heat of battle. I'd rather anything happen to me than people think that I was a coward when the moment came for me to be courageous. 
And so the need for courage when facing a dangerous or a stressful situation is almost as great as the need to survive. As a matter of fact, to be courageous is a necessary trait in order to keep our self-worth alive and prevent it from crashing under the many pressures that we face. I mean, literally, some people would rather die than be considered cowardly. Now this is true not only of soldiers in battle, but also of ordinary people as they face crisis and challenges in everyday life. What husband does not want to be courageous in the, in the, in the face of illness, his own or the illness of his spouse? I've never heard any spouse say, boy, when my partner gets really sick, I can't wait to just cut and run. No, no, no but nobody, I've never heard anybody say that. I'm looking forward to be cowardly. Nobody thinks that. So in my lesson today, I, I want to examine this quality of courage and demonstrate the various elements that come together to produce it. And I want to do this by reviewing the story of a man who found the courage to stand up for God when it wasn't popular, nor was it safe to do. And that's why I've asked you to open your Bibles to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. Now this profile in courage begins with the experience of Joshua, the great leader of the Jews who succeeded Moses. As Joshua is poised to lead the Israelites into the promised land after 40 years of desert wanderings, God spoke to Joshua and the people at this time and He told them that they would need courage to face the future. Now in the book of Joshua chapter 1 verses 2 to 18 we see an explanation of courage and what Joshua said it would require of God's people. I believe that these words can teach us today what we need to know in order to develop a courage of our own. The type of courage that we need, all of us need, to face our trials and our challenges because I am totally convinced that everyone here has a challenge or a trial that they're either going through or they will go through at some time in the future. And so in order to muster up courage, Joshua told the Israelites that they must first cut their losses. Cut their losses. I want to read again the passage that Kendall read. He says, now, it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Now, it's only one verse, but think now. Moses had led the people for 40 years in the desert and his loss was a great blow to the people. Imagine having a leader for 40 years, a great leader, not one that you hated or despised, one that you had confidence in, one who gave you the words of God, a man who was beyond reproach. Imagine this man leads you for 40 years and then is gone. And so God talks to Joshua and he tells him basically, this is not a time for panic. This is not a time to dissolve into grief or regret. The Lord encourages Joshua to accept the present reality. Moses, the great leader, the first leader that these people have ever had, is gone. Accept the loss of a great leader and move on. And so courage requires us to let go of the past and accept the task at hand. And sometimes the past is very pleasant, but the task at hand is difficult. And so we'd rather live in the past than accept the task at hand. Courage lives in the present. No matter how difficult, courage does not live in the past, no matter how pleasant. And so the first ingredient of courage is to let go of the past. Number two, courage requires that you occupy your time in preparation. In verse two, again, he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now what does God say? 
Now therefore arise and cross this Jordan, you and this people, to the land which I am giving them to the sons of Israel. This verse also includes the admonition to get busy. Fear and panic and depression and grief and fatigue, they all have a way of immobilizing us, of driving us into inaction. We kind of seize up. Courage requires us to start the machinery again, to get busy with the business of life or the business of ministry, whatever that may be. And in this case, the Lord gives them the very first step. Don't, uh, don't, don't just stand there, don't just wait there, don't just sit there wringing your hands because you've lost your great leader. Cross the Jordan. Cross the Jordan because there's a long, a long journey of conquest ahead. So let's take the first step. Let's cross the Jordan. You know, sometimes we're discouraged by the mountain that's in front of us. And a good first step is to pray, of course. And then do the next step that you can, whatever that is, no matter how small it is. Just take it one step at a time. That's not new advice, certainly. But it's important advice for someone who is seized up, caught in the moment, caught in fear, paralyzed by the event. Take the step that you can, no matter how small it is. Courage also grows, number three, when you understand that God is with you. Skip down to verse five. It says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Courage is not to be confused with pride. Pride is thinking that you do great things because you're great. Courage is doing great things because God is great. The basic motivation for courageous living is the promise that God is with you and will not abandon you regardless of your state of affairs. How many times the very first thought that we get when something bad happens, you fill in the blank for the bad, okay? How many times the very first thought that comes into our mind is that, uh-oh, well I guess God is just, why did you do this to me? Why did you leave me here? Why did you lead me here? Why, did you, why, why is this happening to me? Our first thought is that somehow God has failed us. That God somehow is against us. Because our life at a certain time is difficult. Men and women of courage are not daredevils, nor are they fools. They are people who overcome fear through faith and don't lose that faith whether they win or they lose. That's the key. Sometimes we think something bad is happening to us because we are bad. If bad things, were hap if bad things happen to us just because we're bad or imperfect, Brothers and sisters, bad things would be happening to us all the time, every single day. <laughs> Number four, Joshua says that courage is instilled when you refuse to give up your principles. Verse six and seven, he says, be strong and courageous for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. You know, Jesus said not to fear those who can destroy the body but not the soul. Fear the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell, Matthew 10, verse 28. People who compromise what is right because they're afraid that the world will not agree. People who compromise what is right because they're afraid that they won't have enough, enough whatever. People who compromise what is right because they're afraid that they'll be considered weak or foolish. These people are afraid of the wrong things. 
They're afraid of the wrong people. Courage means that you are more afraid of God than you are afraid of man and this world. That's courage. Courage also requires that you apply yourself to the task at hand. In verse 10, the passage continues and says, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you are, the, you are to cross this Jordan, to go in the, to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it. You know, I suppose that one of the reasons that things don't get done is that they don't get started or they get started too late. Has that ever happened to you? You start too late? Joshua heard God's command and immediately he set his men into action to prepare the people to cross over to the promised land. God said, hey, stop wringing your hands, cross the river, let's go. Notice that Joshua didn't say, yeah, well, I need to think about that for a minute now. I need to think of, uh, well, do we have enough supplies to go over? You know, where should we cross? Maybe we need to, perhaps we should put out the fleece. And let's ask God a third time, Does this, is this really what He wants? No. He set the people to the task that God had given them. Human nature always tries to do or go the, the easy way, the wide way, the free way. You know, students will waste precious time and leave until the last moment the important business of preparing for an exam. You know, hey, I got to get to the next level before I actually study for that math test. It's important I get to level nine. Or people will do everything else first. You know, they'll talk to their friends and they'll make a call. And when nothing is left to do, they'll study and they wonder why their grades are poor at times. It takes courage, listen, it takes courage to say no to laziness. <laughs> it takes courage to say no to fear, to say no to inaction because of uncertainty. Listen, if the only time we ever did something is when we were certain, nothing would get done. Nothing would get done. Courage requires us to say no to all of these things and begin the job, start the task, get going on the project, whatever it needs to get done. The person with the guts is the person that gets going. Courage also requires us to give ear to past voices of encouragement. Verse 12, it says, To the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God gives you rest and will give you this land. You know, Joshua used the past as a motivator for the future. He reminded them that they were going to get what God promised to Moses. He also was reminding them how God had provided in the past and encouraged them to remember this as they went forward. Every new thing is scary. Every unknown step is risky. It'd be easier to maintain the status quo. It's easier to resist change than to make change. But every time we are afraid of the future, we should count the steps that we have taken in this life with Jesus and ask ourselves if He has ever abandoned us. Has He ever left us hungry? Has He left us homeless? Has He left us without help? Has He ever left us alone? Have you ever been alone and prayed and heard that God said to you, you know what, I'm busy now. <laughs> I tell people, listen to your self-talk when you're thinking about something. If the self-talk is saying to you, you know what, 
you shouldn't do that, or you're not really good enough to do that. And you know, failure, failure is embarrassing. And uh, you know, I don't think you have the strength. You know? And I say to people, if that's the voice that you're listening to, ask yourself, is that Jesus talking to you? Is that the Lord actually saying that to you? Because if it's not Him saying that to you, guess who it is? Guess who it is? Courage has a memory of God. And it is this memory of God that moves us courageously into the future. I remember what God has done for me. I was talking, I forget somebody this week, we were just talking about you know, the past stuff, things we've been through. And I said, and they were, I think, you know, they were having a birthday or something. They were like 30 or 29 years old. And they were thinking, oh my goodness, I'm getting so old, 29. Now when you're as old as Ron, now that's old, you know what I'm saying? But 29, 29, you know. And 29 and this person had a family and a job and a car and a house and so on. And they're thinking, oh, I'm getting so old and I, I don't know if I'm getting ahead, you know. I said, 29, are you kidding me? When I was 29 years old, I was living at the YMCA in Vancouver, eight bucks a day. With no job, no family, nobody around in that city, not a soul, I didn't know a soul. No college degree, no job, nothing. Cost eight dollars to live at the YMCA in a room and a bathroom you shared with 25 other people. But God did not leave me alone. He did not leave me alone. He had to break me down to absolutely nothing so that I would trust Him with everything. Finally, people of courage can enable others with their courage. Verse 16 says, they answered Joshua, the people, saying, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words and all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. The people drew courage from the courage of Joshua. They now responded to him by repeating God's admonition to be strong and courageous. Throughout the passage, it's God saying to them, be strong and courageous, or it's God saying it to Joshua, be strong, do this, but be strong and courageous, do that, but be strong and courageous. And at the end, now it's the people saying to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Courage is an amazing commodity. One's person, one person's courage can be multiplied to inspire one or a million people. It is infectious. Those who never had courage can catch it from being with someone who does have courage. You don't have to sell courage or convince people to buy courage. It overwhelms you, it pushes you, it carries you to do and say things that you've never thought you could say or that you could do. You don't get it from a book. You don't get it from a pill or a bottle. Courage comes from people and is available to everyone. Courage does not discriminate. Everybody, young, old, male, female, strong, weak, everybody can be courageous. So the lesson of Joshua is a lesson that teaches us that God's people need courageous leaders to infect them and inspire them with the courage that they need to do great things for God in this world. I ask you a question. Do you think that God wants this congregation to do little things or big things? Think about it. Do you think that God wants this congregation to go backwards or forwards? Does He want this congregation to shrink 
or to grow? Does He want the people of this congregation to give themselves up as a perfect sacrifice in service to God or just kind of sit around and twiddle their thumbs? What do you think God wants us to do? Well, it's a no-brainer, right? We are all heading into an unknown future. From a worldly perspective, a new type of war with new types of enemies, using weapons and strategy that threatens everyone, not just our military. I mean, some guy with a computer virus can mess up the banking system or you know, the, the, the water. Look, look at the little accident that happened up north there. And no water to drink for, for 500,000 people. Some nasty person could do that to any big city. 50 years ago, people didn't think about those type of threats. And we also have the challenge to continue proclaiming the gospel and expanding the kingdom and standing fast against Satan despite the storms that rage in our lives as well as in the church. Will we have the courage to do all these things? Will we have the courage to overcome what stands before us in our own personal lives, in our own private struggles? I pray to God that we will. And I also pray to God that we will have the courage to abandon our sins and to come to Christ in repentance and baptism. You know, one of the single most courageous things that I see, and we all see from time to time, are the people that come forward and acknowledge that God is not in their lives. Perhaps because they have not yet confessed Him before men and been buried in baptism, or simply because they've carelessly put aside their faith and gone back into the world. I'll tell you, we make movies about guys, you know, Robocop and you know, firing guns and blowing up stuff, but it takes a lot of courage to walk down this aisle. That's courage. That's courage that not only inspires people, that's the kind of courage that is pleasing to God. So I will pray and I continue to pray that we will have the courage to acknowledge our needs and come to God with our hurts and failures. And finally, I pray that this great congregation here in Choctaw that will celebrate this year in September its 75th anniversary I pray that this great congregation will continue to provide a godly example and have the courage to continue preaching and teaching God's word to this community as well as to the world in its various mission efforts. We speak of Brother Robert George whose health is failing, he is in decline. Many of us have only seen him, many of the newer members or younger people have only seen Robert George in the years where he, his health was frail. You don't remember the Robert George of 1980 or 1990, who was a, a powerful missionary, who's been responsible for hundreds, even thousands of people being baptized, who's inspired so many people to begin serving the Lord. There was a courageous, a very courageous man. We must not fail, brothers and sisters, so many people depend on us. And so if anyone needs courage this morning to begin the Christian walk or to continue the Christian walk, we encourage you to come to God who provides courage in an abundant way. Won't you do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.